it is going to be a, like you said earlier, a roller coaster of emotions of a show. Yeah, this this one, guys. You know, our, uh, you know that the moniker. It, if it's happening in Hollywood, we're talking about it. And unfortunately, the most talked about story in Hollywood this week is obviously the tragic death from the uh, accidental shooting on the set of Alec Baldwin's Western. Um, <sighs> We've got a lot to talk about. It just seems like every minute something new is breaking from that story, and we're going to have the very latest for you. Um, and we're going to dive a little bit deep into it and, and, and talk about it because it's important. It's it's important, and we feel like we have to address it a little bit. Um, we got other stuff too, though. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's not all super serious and super sad. But you guys know everybody is talking about it, so that's why we are also talking about it. It's very important to bring awareness to things like this, so that's why we are here to talk about these situations. But that is later on the show. Now, let's get a little crazy. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Crazy Ant Farm. Holy moly, it is episode 178 this week. Man, oh man, two episodes away from the big 180. Yeah, can you even believe that? Like, what is going on? We are pumped up. We've got a bunch of news to talk about. Some some delays in Marvel. Uh-oh, what's mm. going on there? Uh, some other delays from other film studios. Casting news. We got some more stuff to talk about like that. Uh, the NBA is back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Cowboys are rolling, so it's Team Sports Day for us here. If you're watching, you'll see what I, you'll know what we're talking about. Uh, just a whole bunch going on, man, that we got to talk about. And I have to let everyone know, my hands smell like pumpkins. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if no one knew, if no one knew, and if not, what the fuck? Obviously, next week is Halloween, so we just got done carving our pumpkins. Now, 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 look later, you know, if if you're watching this like tonight, right, Saturday, look, we'll be posting pictures of what we carved and everything. And if you know us at all, if you pay any attention to us at all, you are probably got an idea of where we were going with carving pumpkins, right? right? I mean, we're geeks. That should be enough for you to go, oh, okay, what what did they do? Yeah. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay <laughs> tuned. But you guys know your host with the most. Myself, J-Lo, fantastic, and the one only Mal. What's up? You can follow us both on all social media at J-Lo, fantastic, and the one and only at Crazy and Guy 1970 Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we have a lot to talk about this week in the entertainment news. Like we teased a little bit earlier, there's a lot of serious stuff going on in Hollywood, and we have to address it because... It's everywhere, and people need to take the proper protocols and the proper precautions to make sure some serious shit doesn't happen. And, I mean, you know, bringing awareness to a situation is probably one of the most important things we as um, influencers, I guess you could say, podcast hosts, uh, production company ourselves can do with our platform. So that's what we're supposed to do. That is what we're here to do. And we talk about it all the time. This podcast is geared towards up-and-comers trying to break into the entertainment industry. And that's for the what to do and what not to do. And what to do also when something feels shady. Because a lot of things in the entertainment industry can be very shady. And it's okay to take yourself out of situations sometimes. Yeah. So that's what we're here for, man. That's what we're here to do. We're here to talk about the stuff going down in Hollywood. And man, oh man, it is uh, serious this week. Yeah. But before we get started... We want to say be sure to visit our website, www.crazyantmedia.com, where you can start rocking the latest and greatest Crazy Ant Media gear. We got shirts, we got hats, we got sweatshirts, Christmas merch is right around the corner, fall merch is right around the corner as well, November, yes. oh my goodness, we're so super freaking excited, guys, so be sure to head over there, and if you're not already following ItCap Podcast or Crazy Ant Media, we will let you know when the promotional sales are so that you can get them for the cheap, cheap. For the low, low. We are here <laughs> for you, you. Okay? I'm just saying. No popping tags, though. No, 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 no popping no, tags. Uh-uh. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> but, guys, it's uh, let's get it started because it is very necessary. It's what we have to do. And we lost some legends and some up-and-comers and some established people this week. Peter Scarlioli? Uh, Scolari. Scolari. Okay. Who rose to stardom on the brilliant but quickly canceled 
Bosom Buddies. Boosom Buddies. Boosom Buddies, alongside Tom Hanks, uh, died this week at the age of 66. After a two-year battle with cancer, Peter was a prolific actor both on television and on Broadway. He won an Emmy in 2016 for his portrayal as Tad uh, Hor- Horvath yep. uh, on Girls, the father of Hannah, who played by Lena Dunham. Uh, from 1987 to 1989, he was nominated three times for a supporting actor yeah. uh, Emmys for his role as Michael Harris and Newhart, uh, Bob Newhart's uh, beloved CBS comedy. Though he was sick, Peter was working until up until recently. He co-starred on the just concluded second season of Evil, uh, and on which he played Bishop. Uh, Thomas Marks. Yeah. So, and it was a really creepy kind of dark role. Yet he brought his like normal what he's known for humor to it. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I was really enjoy really enjoying him on Evil. But um, I'm old as dirt, so you guys know my. I mean, I'm most familiar with him, obviously, from Booze and Buddies with Tom Hanks. I mean, that show was epic. It launched both of their careers. Nobody knew who the fuck Tom Hanks was prior to Booze and Buddies or yeah. Peter Scolari, and it launched them to superstardom, and they had been best friends ever since um, and remained close. And then, of course, Newhart, uh, you just... This is one of those well-kept secrets. I didn't even know he was battling cancer. Mm. It just it wasn't out there, right? It wasn't really reported on. So like at this two-year battle, it was – I was shocked when I saw the news the other day. Right. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Thoughts and prayers go out to his family and friends. Of course, Crazy Ant is always with them. Uh, reach out over social media if you ever want to talk. Yep. And now, unfortunately, we're going to dive into the, the, the big – story of the week and um big story for all the wrong reasons uh it, you know it, this is this is a tough one and bear with us because there's a lot but we want to make sure that you guys have all the facts all the current know-how of what's going on in the situation don't make assumptions don't there are so many bad posts out there right now that are inaccurate and totally wrong so we're going to give you all of the legit facts that we know of right now and we'll talk about it a little bit. We're of course talking about the tragic death of uh, deaths of a uh, death of Helena Hutchins and the shooting of the director of the film. Um, as you guys know, director of photography Helena Hutchins, who was 42, guys, 42, tragically died this week after being injured on the set of the upcoming Western film Rust. The fatal injury occurred when a prop gun was discharged by the film's lead actor Alec Baldwin. Baldwin was also serving as one of the producers on the $7 million budgeted film. Now, according to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office, as I said, we're going to give you all facts here, okay? Hutchins had been transported by helicopter to the University of New Mexico Hospital, where she was pronounced dead on the scene. The second victim, as I said, was the film's director, Joel Souza, who's 48, who's also the writer of the film, by the way, who was taken by ambulance to Christus St. Vincent Regional Medical Center, treated for his injuries, and was released. Um, Juan Rios, a spokesman for the sheriff's office, said that the interviews are ongoing and evidence is still being collected. At this point, right now, no charges have been filed, guys. No charges. So if you see anything like that, that's not accurate right now. According to a search warrant filed in Santa Fe court, assistant director David Halls unwittingly handed Baldwin a loaded weapon, told him it was safe. He referred to it as a cold weapon, which in the industry means it's safe to use. Um, in the moments before the actor fatally shot the cinematographer. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office obtained the warrant yesterday so investigators could document the scene at the ranch outside Santa Fe, New Mexico. They sought Baldwin's blood-stained costume as evidence, as well as the weapon that was fired, other prop guns and ammunition. They're also searching to find out whether footage exists of the fatal shooting. Now, according to the records, the gun was one of three that the film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez, and for anybody that doesn't know what an armorer is, that's a specialist on a film set that is responsible for guns and for any kind of weapons on set that's their job that's what they do okay so apparently the film's armor hannah gutierrez had set on a cart outside the wooden structure which is a church if you guys haven't seen pictures or videos of it it's a church on this ranch um where the scene was being filmed the gun was grabbed from the cart by assistant director david howells and brought inside the church to baldwin unaware that it was loaded with live rounds 
first judge, uh, first judicial district attorney, Mark uh, Mary Carmack, sorry, uh, said in a statement, quote, we are assisting the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office and have offered our full support to them. At this time, we do not know if charges will be filed. We will look into all the facts and evidence of the case with great discretion and have further information at a later time. Our thoughts right now are with all affected by this tragedy. Now, from what we understand, what the delay is and why they're considering and waiting for evidence and more stuff from the scene of the crime is, before any criminal homicide charges or otherwise, manslaughter, negligent, you know, anything, um, could be filed, they are, uh, according to law enforcement, have to. There has to be a determination on whether the prop gun considered is a deadly weapon. Was it considered a deadly weapon? Um, Carmack's office said it believes it could be, but wants to see what the cops discover in the evidence and if it was blanks or live rounds in the prop gun before making any final decision. And I will say that it it has been confirmed in an affidavit from one of the detectives on the scene. It was a live round. It was not a blank. It was a live round in the in the gun. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, according to multiple sources, with direct knowledge of the situation, the production has been having multiple issues, including problems related to safety before this fatal incident. Uh, now, that included at least one previous incident involving a misfiring of a weapon that was used just days before in a scene. A source said, quote, a gun had two misfires in a closed cab cabin uh they fired loud pops a person who was holding it in their hands and it just went off <laughs> and, like what in the days before the incident the film crew had been complaining about poor and unsafe working conditions much of the crew walked off set over these concerns on the morning before the shooting citing a wide range of complaints and some were replaced by non-union workers uh several of those who quit wrote letters of resignation one member of the camera crew wrote on a private Facebook page, quote, We cited everything from the lack of payment for three weeks, uh, taking uh, our ho hotels away despite asking for them in our deals, uh, lack of COVID safety, and on top of that, poor gun safety, poor on-set safety, period. Now, they brought in four non-union guys to replace them, and they said that they were going to call the cops on the people who resigned. So this set has just been off to a bad start I since mean, the beginning. Yeah, it just – and of course, you know, with, with – Stuff like that being said, right, and everything, of course, the, the production company has to respond, and they did. A spokesperson for Rust Movie Productions LLC said, quote, The entire cast and crew has been absolutely devastated by this tragedy, and we send our deepest condolences to Helena's family and loved ones. We have halted production on the film for an undetermined period of time and are fully cooperating with the Santa Fe Police Department's investigation. We will be providing counseling services to everyone connected to the film as we work to process this awful event the safety of our cast and crew is the top priority of rust productions and everyone associated with the company though we were not made aware of any official complaints concerning weapon or prop safety on the set we will be conducting an internal review of procedures while production is shut down mm. Mm. i wish in that facebook post they would have named names like who was saying like we're going to call the cops on you. You're kicked yeah, off set, all this shit, I've, because it's fucking crazy. I find it hard to believe that the production company didn't hear about mishaps yeah. with the guns. Or... Yeah, I call bullshit on that one. And yeah. the shooting is being investigated by the New Mexico's Occupational Health and Safety Bureau, uh, which can impose civil penalties for workplace accidents, even if law enforcement determines that no crime occurred. Rebecca Rose, duty... Uh, uh, Deputy Cabinet Secretary of New Mexico Environmental Department said in a statement, quote, Our state OSHA uh, program is investigating this. The state takes all workplace safety issues very seriously and will work diligently through our investigation of this uh, tragic fatality. OHSB is investigating an incident in coordination with law enforcement, the employer, and the employees. Now, no, no additional information will be released at this time pending completion of the investigation. Now, this one, I feel like they're going to try to get wrapped up as quick as possible to try – just try to get to the bottom as quick as possible, I should say, because I don't feel like they want to rush anything, but they also want to feel like the family needs closure. Yeah, and – um. 
you know, I, I'm just I'm just gonna say it. I I definitely a wrongful death suit's coming. If any of the claims are true by the crew members that walked off that there was other incidents with gun safety and that they weren't following COVID protocols and and it, a wrongful death suit's coming and rightfully so. Um, uh, if that if that is the case, I'm I'm also gonna go out on a limb here and say that if there were other incidents with the guns just misfiring, um, or any issues with the guns whatsoever, I think criminal charges are coming. Yeah. I think, and not for Alec Baldwin because I I honestly believe Alec Baldwin did not know the gun was loaded. Okay, that so many other people are in charge of handling that gun prior to it ever getting into his hands. Okay, um. But the armor, as I said at the top, that is their sole responsibility. The prop master and the armor are responsible for those weapons before they ever make it to set. If you had already had an incident with guns discharging without even being fired, I think production should have been shut down right there until you figured that out. Yeah. The fact that you kept going and this armor again just put these guns out there and said they're good to go. I mean, guys, there's protocol. First of all, the, the first AD that grabbed it and brought it to Baldwin, he is the last guy. That guy is supposed to clear and check. He is supposed to, in front of the actor, show the chamber and the barrel, shine a light so that everyone can see that there is no interference and that there is nothing in the gun. That is proper protocol since the Brandon Lee incident way back in the day. That clearly was not done. This guy just grabbed the gun, handed it to Baldwin, and said it's cold and good to go. You have to check. You have to check. I, I have to believe criminal charges are going to be coming. Agreed, agreed. Especially, like you said, against the armor and that, uh, I mean, it's possibly the first AD with everything going on. But also against the producers. When the union people walked off set and they, I bet they just found these, not to say non-union people don't know what they're doing or are less, less experienced per se, but I mean... They obviously rushed to keep this thing in production, and sometimes when you rush, bad shit happens. For example, what we are reporting on. So you have to make sure everything is safe, especially that really, like you said, it should have started when the two misfires happened a couple of days ago. Yeah, because that is absolutely ridiculous. Keep wrapping our brains around it and. She should not be dead. And 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 look, like you said, it, it, non-union workers are skilled. They're awesome. We used non-labor union workers. Um, you know, they're they're fantastic. But if they were just plugged into spots, they didn't go through the protocol of learning gun safety that guns were going to be on the set because that is protocol. Yeah. You have to you have to have this long like meeting and the and the, and the armorer and the producers and the ADs have to discuss with the crew and show them how to handle the guns and show them how to clear the chambers and all that all that has to happen. So if these guys were just like, "Oh shit, we need to plug somebody in" and they were just thrown on set. I mean, that clearly did not happen then. So I it's I know. Just... I feel like the majority of the fault should fall on the producers because I feel like they were trying so hard for this production not to be shut down. And then there it is, guys, because as I said at the very top, while criminal, as in homicide or accidental manslaughter or, you know, whatever, those type char- will n- probably not be filed against Alec Baldwin. Uh, he is, he could face criminal charges for neglect, you know, um, due to the fact that he's a producer on the film. Yeah. He is a producer. So it is his responsibility to make sure those type things don't happen, especially when you're on set every day. You're not just the producer, but you're the star of the film. When those gun incidents happened, you should have right there said, guys, we need to shut this down and let's figure this out. I mean, as a producer, that you should that should have been immediate. Yeah, like, exactly. I mean, he is a powerful man that comes from a powerful Hollywood family. So, I mean, he should have just stepped up to the plate. And I mean... It's kind of a mixed bag for me with him because I feel at the same time I feel so bad for him. Oh. He's going to have that like hanging over his head the rest of his yeah. life. Yeah. That is he's I mean, I would have nightmares about this shit. And I mean, he knew her. He knew her. So I can only imagine what he's this going is... through, but I can also only imagine what her family is going through and 
it just shouldn't have happened. Exactly. This is this is a tragic death that's highly preventable and should never have happened. And moving forward, we need to do our best, which is why we're talking about this, to make sure it never happens again. We're coming at it from a perspective, guys. We just, as you guys know, we just finished shooting a film that we directed – and a gun is used prevalently throughout the entire film. It's about gun violence and suicide, and we did. We used a prop gun. Now, for anybody out there that doesn't realize, prop guns, not all of them are rubber or wooden. Some prop guns are actually real guns that have been disengaged and unable to fire. Some of them are real guns that can still fire so that they can fire blanks. In our case, it was a disengaged real gun. The firing pin had been removed. And we can tell you for right now, fact, even though that firing pin had been removed... We relentlessly checked that gun. We took it apart. We made sure the firing pin wasn't in it. We we checked the barrel and the magazine every time prior to putting it in somebody's hand. And it was locked up until it was ready to be brought onto set. We introduced the gun to our lead actress that was going to be handling the gun so that she became familiar with it and how it worked. We had her check the gun. Like, that's the protocol. And so... I can only speak to how we did things, but I, I just I can't even imagine how it could ever get to the point where it gets on set loaded. I, I just I just thinking about what we did, I can't even imagine how it even gets there yeah. like that. I, I, I just don't know. And we were personally we were at that location. We location scouted for a film that we were gonna work on back in the day. So we're familiar with the location and poor uh Imogene Hughes the owner of the property, I can't even imagine. Nobody's talking about what she must be going through to have this happen on basically every Western that's ever been filmed since the late 40s all the way up through now has either been entirely shot there or partially shot there for decades, guys. So, I mean, she's got to be going through some stuff too. I, I know. Just... It's terrifying. I, I keep thinking about like we were in that church. Yeah, we were literally in that church where it happened. It's just... It's terrifying, and so we forgive us, but we're just kind of we're wrapping our heads around it because we have so many different perspectives of yeah. it. Because it's kind of touched us personally with the film that we did, and then being familiar with the location and everything, it's just really tough. But I want to jump to Disney now and talk about like what we were talking about with having this out there and having these conversations and talking and what the industry needs to start doing. And kudos to the people over at The Rookie on ABC because their response was immediate. It was. The industry's already seeing changes being made following the tragic shooting. ABC cop drama The Rookie is banning live weapons on its set effective immediately. Showrunner Alexi Hawley led the charge for the change as sources say he informed ABC executives that production would no longer be using quarter or half loads while filming the Nathan Fillion led drama. For you guys that don't know quarter filled or half filled loads means they're firing blanks but if you guys aren't familiar with that, blanks are everything but the actual front end of the bullet. That means everything else, the gunpowder, the all the stuff that's associated with bullets are in there except for the front projectile. Still very dangerous. And quarter load and half load means how much gunpowder and force is being used to get the shot that they want. It's, I just want to explain that because that's what he's talking about. The series has, over the past two seasons, primarily used CGI to prom uh, portray muzzle flashes, but occasionally would use live weapons on large outdoor scenes. Okay? Um, in a memo sent to the staff, Hawley said, quote, as of today, it is now policy on the rookie that all gunfire on set will be with all soft guns, which are BB guns, guys, pellets, um, with CG muzzle flashes added in post. There will be no more live weapons on the show. The safety of our cast and crew is too important. Any risk is too much risk. Airsoft guns are effectively BB guns that use a form of pellet instead of bullets meaning they produce uh, less energy than a normal gun would. They're often used on film and TV sets as they look almost identical to other guns. Um, and my question is, why haven't we been doing this for years? Why can't we use rubber and wooden guns and then just... All the sound effects and all the flashes and the muzzle shots and the gunpowder residue, and all that can be done in post with CGI. All exactly. of that. And has been able to be done like that for years. Exactly. So why? I don't, I don't know. I know. We're going to deep dive into it in our next episode of Is It Worth It? So stay tuned for that next week. So 
lot of exciting, crazy shit, because we will be bringing up all of the past incidents that have happened on set that involves a firearm. So be prepared for that. Like I said, next week, be watching that next week. Yeah. That's why you should subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, lighter news, but also some still uh, news. <laughs> um, Disney has uh, delayed release plans for several upcoming films, including... Doctor Strange into the multi uh, multiverse of madness from March 25th to May 6th. Thor Love and Thunder, uh, the fourth installment of Thor, May 6th to July 8th. And Black Panther Wakanda Forever from July 8th to November 11th. Now, with Black Panther's sequel uh, jumping to November, with the Marvels has been uh, postponed to mm. early 2023. And the Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania has been bumped from February 17th to July 28th of 2023 and four untitled 2023 movies from Marvel 20th Century and Disney live action division have been removed from the release mm. calendar uh, while one untitled Marvel movie has relocated from November 10th to November 3rd of 2023 along with a deluge of Marvel delays Disney has moved the fifth Indiana Jones installment back an entire year year now i'm not surprised by that one no uh, um, he was injured i mean it takes that guy yeah. some time to recover exactly exactly <laughs> uh the still untitled film starring harrison ford as the uh 40 wearing uh swashbuckling archaeologist will open on june 30th of 2023 instead of july 29th of 2022 According to the sources at Disney, the scheduling overhaul is related to production and not box office number returns. Uh, the next Black Panther entry, for one, is still filming in Atlanta mm -hmm. since Marvel has become the interconnected and crazy planned universe that Kevin Feige himself created, uh, which spans dozens of films and several new television series. Any production delay causes is a domino effect, guys. It's not like if one has a delay they're all gonna have a delay yeah that's literally what's happening and when i say kevin feige created a meme the mcu that right. we all know and love today but it it just sucks it is what it is but it sucks the one i'm most bummed about is is ant-man and the wasp and the quantum uh mania because i've been seeing all kinds of reports and they're all talking all of them paul rudd evangeline Lilly, the the director and everybody that it's it's going to drastically change the MCU as we know it. Mm. That nothing we've seen so far, even with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and what's getting ready to come up in Spider-Man uh, No Way Home and all that, they, they, they're saying you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. What we're going to do to the MCU is like crazy. And there's been lo so many rumors that the Fantastic Four are going to be introduced in the quantum realm. That that you know, so many different things. So I just I'm like totally bummed that we have to wait. Right. I'm so excited. For <laughs> what are you going to do to the MCU? What's I need to happening? know. <laughs> like, What's happening? Oh my goodness. Hey, they've got other stuff happening at Disney too, though. It's not all Marvel and indie. No. Uh, 20th Century Studios has acquired the spec script Darby Harper Wants You to Know, starring Storm Reid. The film is scheduled to begin production in December. The story follows Darby Harper, who after suffering a near-death experience as a child, is granted the ability to see ghosts. To combat the existential boredom of high school, she runs a side business counseling local spirits in her spare time. When an unexpected occurrence happens between Darby and Capri, the most popular girl at her high school, Darby reluctantly agrees to help her and in the process learns how to fit into the living world again. Mm. This kind of sounds like... Ghost Whisperer. Right? A little bit. I mean, you, know, you should have Jennifer Love just pop in there. Exactly. I'm just saying. Exactly. Sorry. Now, this next one we are super freaking excited about, and I'm so happy I got this one because, <laughs> I mean, a lot of rumors have been floating around. Star Wars is coming with the series. Disney Plus is making some amazing things. Yes. But Ahsoka is getting her own series starring Rosario Dawson, which we're super freaking excited about. But guess who's coming back to play his iconic character well his shared iconic character i should say <laughs> uh hayden christensen is coming yes. back to reprise his role as anakin skywalker slash dark vader in the disney plus latest star wars spinoff ahsoka which uh, is set 
to start production in 2022. Uh, he will appear alongside Rosario, like I said, who plays the title character, and the Jedi Padawan of Anakin Skywalker, who appeared in The Mandalorian. Christensen uh, will likely be featured in flashbacks or as a Jedi uh, presence, at, as it tends to be the case in the uh, Star Wars universe. As the series is set five years after Return of the Jedi, the news comes after it was revealed at the end of last year that Christian would reprise his role as the father of Darth Vader in the Disney Plus Obi Wan saw or Obi Wan series alongside Ewan McGregor. So he's popping up everywhere. We're so freaking excited! And I, like I said, I hope it's flashbacks to when he was teaching Ahsoka, or it's like yeah, him as a Jedi presence. Where you got, still kind of guiding yeah, her. Yeah, still guiding badass. her, like admitting he was wrong because this is after Darth Vader died. So there's so much, so much. It may be even him admitting his wrongs, admitting he shouldn't have done things that he did. Yeah, and I, I, I kind of like the idea of it being – a Jedi presence or flashbacks because in Obi-Wan, we're going to see him as Darth Vader. Exactly. We're going to get plenty of him as Darth Vader because in the time frame that that takes place, it's after he's converted to, to Darth Vader. Yes. So, you know, we're going to, so the idea of seeing him more as Anakin again, I like that. So I hope Agreed. that is where they go with it. That, that's going to be good. Um, ABC announced that Women of the Movement, the upcoming limited series based on the true story of Mamie Till Mobley, will now premiere on January 6th at 8 p.m. This is the one we told you about. The six-episode series will air in three parts for three consecutive weeks. Uh, this is the series that stars Adrian Warren as Mamie, the mother of Emmett Till, who was brutally lynched in 1955 in the Jim Crow South, as you guys know, and if you don't, shame on you. The series sees Mamie risk her life seeking justice for Emmett, keeping his name and murder in the news, and igniting the civil rights movement. This is going to be such a powerful and important show. I'm glad that they're premiering it right away off the beginning of the year um and i can't wait to watch this one yeah i mean we've been talking about it a lot and i just cannot wait it's gonna be so damn good and like we said content is the best form of learning so disney is doing something right which yes. i mean they're doing a lot of things right let's be honest about it <laughs> uh the la law sequel i called this uh, did you <laughs> a did. series pilot at abc has cast corbin bernstein to reprise his role from the original series now bernstein returns as the role of arnold becker a former uh lothario lothario um becker hasn't changed since the 1980s uh but the world has now <laughs> in his 60s he struggles with a rapidly shifting sexual and political landscape bernstein appeared in all eight seasons of la law as well as the reunion film that came out in uh, 2002 he received two emmy nominations for yep. best actor in the drama series for his work on the show he previously announced returning cast member Blair Underwood an updated logline for the project describes ever as a re-envisioning of the original feature familiar characters working alongside new ones on the most hot button issues of today. Yes. Now see I said that I thought other former members would return to the show along with Blair Underwood but I totally knew Corbin would because as soon as we found out Emily Van Camp was leaving The Resident uh, you know, he plays her dad on that and <laughs> don't really need the dad around anymore right. if the daughter's dead and no longer a part of the show. So Corbin had a little free time now. <laughs> I mean, totally saw that one coming. Right. I love him, though. He's a great actor. I don't think he got nearly enough recognition for his work on The Resident, which was he suicide topics and just like he, so many things he should have gotten Emmy nomination. But I'm excited about this one. Yes. Um... Let's see, ABC has picked up writer and executive producer Ajay Shahi's single camera comedy, The Son-in-Law, to pilot. News about the show's development was first announced in January. Now, the series, which hails from 20th Television, is about a salt-of-the-earth man who finds himself seeking the approval of his new fiancé's sophisticated parents, even as he himself is a difficult-to-impress father-in-law to his daughter's longtime boyfriend. Ah, so it's, he's trying to impress himself to the parents and 
the the daughter's boyfriend's trying to impress. Him. That's gonna be funny. It is. Gonna it, be funny. It, I mean, that'll be interesting. That's a, that's an uh, at least it's original. Exactly. That's original. So I like that. Exactly. Well, Sam Richardson is getting in the Halloween spirit for the Hocus Pocus sequel, which I just watched the original again last week. Getting <laughs> in the Halloween mood. Yes. The Veep actor and Ted Lasso actor is in final negotiations to appear alongside Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy Majid. Jimmy, uh, in the upcoming Disney Plus film, Hocus Pocus 2, is the follow-up of the 1993 comedy starring Midler Parker and the other Kathy uh, as three witches who are resurrected in Salem, Massachusetts, but are bent on becoming immortal. The sequel is currently in production, and we'll see the three young women accidentally bring the Sanderson sisters back to the modern-day Salem. Love everything about that except the name. Come up with something better than Hocus Pocus 2. I know, Come right? on, give me, give me something creative there, guys. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> Crazy ex-girlfriend creators Rachel Bloom and Eileen Brosh McKenna are re-teaming on a comedy series currently in development at Hulu. Hulu is kicking ass, y'all. I'm just saying it. Um, and this sounds like a cool one. Titled Badass and Her Sister. The series focuses on an impossibly badass spy, played by Bloom, who tires of her life as sexy espionage, goes to live with goes to live with her sister, uh, pushover twin sister. Oh, that's gonna be even better. Also played by Bloom. And together they learn what it means to actually be a badass. Brosh McKenna and Bloom would serve as writers, co-showrunners, and executive producers on the series. So anytime an actor plays twins. That's always entertaining. It it's is. always good. So I like this. This sounds original. It sounds fun. It's going to be great. Yes, definitely, definitely. Well, now History of the World Part 1 is finally getting a Part 2. Yes! With Hulu ordering a variety series follow-up to the classic Mel Brooks comedy. Uh, History of the World Part 2 is being described as a sequel to the 1981 film. The film was made up in the segments set during different time periods of the world's history. Among those uh, was the Stone Age, Ancient Rome, and the French Revolution. Uh, like most of Brooks' work, it will feature musical numbers, including uh, the one about the Spanish Inquisition and, of course, Jews in space. <laughs> of course. Uh, there is no word yet on which events of the series will cover. Hulu has ordered ep- eight episodes of the series, though, uh, of the show. And the writer's room is beginning in October with production slated to begin in spring of 2022. Now, Brooks is a writer and executive producer on the series, so it should be great. Hmm. I, I'm all down. I love Mel Brooks. I've always thought his comedy is fantastic. Blazing Saddles, all the good stuff. So all I, the I'm, good stuff. I'm totally down for that. Well, apparently, Why the Last Man has made his last stand. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry, dad joke there. Why the Last Man has been canceled by FX weeks before its first season debuts its final episode on FX on Hulu. The news was shared by Why the Last Man showrunner Eliza Clark through her Twitter on this, this past Sunday. In her post, Clark thanks FX and the show's creative team for their partnership on the project. She also expresses hope that Why the Last Man will be able to continue its run on a different network. Eh, I don't think so. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, Heading over to Fox, Tubi, the Fox-owned free ad-supported streamer, has acquired the rights of The Freak Brothers, a stoner comedy starring Woody Harrelson, Pete Davidson, John Goodman, and Tiffany Haddish. I'm excited already. All stoners in real life. Exactly. Uh, The Freak Brothers follows a cannabis-loving character, a freewheeling Franklin Freak, who is played by Harrison, a paranoid uh, uh, Phineas Phineas T. Freakers, who's uh, <laughs> Davidson, and Manchild, Freddy, Freddy, <laughs> Fat Freddy, uh, Freakowski, who's played by Goodman, and their <laughs> cat Kitty, who's played by Haddish, <laughs> uh, who wake up from a 50 year nap after smoking a magical strain of weed in 1968. Now, in the show, they must learn how to adjust to life with a new family in present-day San Francisco. Uh, Tubi will premiere the first two episodes on Sunday, November 14th, and will release additional episodes on Sundays, one per week, through December 26th of the finale. Now, the writers must have been high while they wrote this shit, because this just sounds go goofy. So this is about three stoner dudes and their cat who smoke some magic weed in the late 60s and wake up in 2021? 
That's what it sounds like. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> you know we're going to watch it, though. Oh, yeah. You know sure. we're going to watch it. There's no way. All right. Uh, hey, are you interested in how Dune is doing? Well, uh, Logan has seen it. I'm watching it tonight after we do the show here. Uh, Warner Brothers and Legendary's Dune is expected to open at the top of the domestic box office, to nobody's surprise, obviously. But here is the surprise. The much-anticipated, uh, highly, oh, it's going to kill, it's going to slay because it was doing so big overseas. Mm, not so much here. Yeah. $39.1 million is what it is expected to bring in over the weekend. The film launched to only $17.5 million on Friday. Warner Brothers also debuted Dune simultaneously, as you guys know, on HBO Max as part of their year-long strategy of bolstering subscription numbers and accounting for what they called at the time muted box office. Um... <laughs> It does say, though, although its HBO Max release may be softening Dune's impact at the box office, Warner Media chair Anna Sarnoff indicated the studio will take HBO Max viewership numbers into consideration in its decision to bank a sequel. I mean, I think they're going to make a sequel no matter what. They have to. I mean, it only covers the first half of the book. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, I really enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. But they paid a shit ton of money. It's like we were talking about on our first episode episode of is it worth it they really should have reevaluated their streaming plan because boy oh boy just watching the film you're like damn they definitely shelled out some money it i really compared it to it could have had an avatar box office opening i mean i don't think anything will ever come close to avengers endgame but i think it could have been in that same conversation and warner brothers just dropped the ball and i also blame a little bit on the uh covid and the pandemic and people not going to the box office but uh, I'm just you know saying. why I think they're, they, they – they, because we saw, right? Disney changed course. They're like, okay, forget that. We're just going to do the rest of the year in, in theaters, right? Warner Brothers – Why? I'm sure people are asking, why don't they just do that? Why don't they say, hey, never mind. We will put them in theater. I think it's because when they made the decision to put all of these things simultaneously and they said they were going to do it for the rest of the year, they paid out a shit ton of the money to the creators that got pissed off about that and now they're stuck. Exactly. They can't put it in theaters now because they already paid out all the money to the creators to for their supposed back end deals. So they're, they're in, kind of fucked themselves. They're in too deep. Yeah, now. that's they're I mean, in way too deep, which is super unfortunate because, like I said, really good movie. Yep. The shoe? No, it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, well, uh, Warner Media's DC fandom racked up 66 million global yeah, views this year. I was one of them. But I mean, everybody knows it wasn't surprising because I feel like everybody was watching that shit. Oh, yeah. Uh, that number triples last year's uh, confab that drew 22 million views worldwide. As we told you, the event dropped on multiple uh, fresh product of the warner brothers dc label including uh, but not limited to the new batman trailer sneak peeks of the flash black adam aquaman and the lost kingdom and the second annual conference was available in more than 220 countries in 12 different languages and more than 50 live streams across all social media platforms, several hundred media outlets rebroadcasted the stream. Damn. Warner Media also reports that social sentiment over, was overwhelmingly positive, uh, with DC fandom trimming at number one for Twitter over eight straight hours in the U.S., and DC fandom also trending in the top 50 in 53 countries all around the world. So, I mean, this is a very popular thing, in my opinion. Like I said last week, they got people excited about DC properties again. Yes, so. and... I I, and we say this every time we talk about this, but there has to be an announcement soon. Feige is just way too smart. There has to be an MCU thing like this to just – DC proves it works. It increased massively over year one to year two. And just think what Marvel would be able to do in an event like this that's all about Marvel. I mean the Disney 23 thing is cool, but that's all Disney. Just just Marvel. Imagine what that would I do. I mean I don't think they're ever going to break apart from that in my opinion just because Warner Media doesn't do that with their other shit. So, I mean, you know, I don't think it's ever going to break apart. I, I want it to. I just want Marvel. Mm, just Marvel. I mean, I love Disney, but I would like to see just a Marvel event. That would be badass. Okay, so it wasn't all great news for Warner Media, though. 
Have you seen this? This is the <laughs> other big story of the week uh, that we just have to talk about, but begrudgingly so. Former Batwoman star Ruby Rose is once again commenting on her exit from the series, this time airing out several allegations of wrongdoing on the set of the CW show, which they, if by the way you didn't know, she now refers to herself as they, Uh, which they said led to their departure. It was shocking to fans when Rose abruptly announced their departure in May of 2020, leaving their title role as Cat Kane Batwoman. Now, at that time, you guys might remember, there were rumblings that Rose was not happy on the show, but they left with little clarity on their exact reasons for leaving. And in a statement actually said that she was, it was not a decision that she made lightly, as she has the utmost respect for the cast, crew, and everyone involved with the show, both in Vancouver and in Los Angeles. Now, pay close attention to that statement. The utmost respect for everybody involved in the show in all locations, cast, and crew. Why is that important? Because a couple of months after that exit... She again revealed more in an interview saying that returning to work 10 days after a surgery maybe wasn't the best idea and it made their taxing job even more difficult. Now, more than a year later in this week, uh, Rose has broken her silence yet again in a scorched earth fashion in a lengthy post on Instagram. Rose unloaded on the reasons why they really left Batwoman. No, this time she really means it. This is what really happened, according to her. Rose who had surgery for a stunt injury that they had suffered, included footage of their surgery in the post, saying they were forced to return to work by former head of Warner Brothers TV, Peter Roth, in those just 10-day period. Rose alleged Roth threatened them in returning by claiming they would cost the production millions and that the whole crew and cast would be fired if she didn't return. Rose also accused Roth of inappropriate behavior with a bizarre claim that he asked women to steam his pants while he was still wearing them and alleged he had Rose investigated by a PI after they left the series. Additionally, Rose mounted an attack on her former co-star, Duggery Scott, who played their father, accusing him of misconduct on the set, including allegedly being abusive to women, hurting a female stunt double. Rose also detailed what they described as unsafe working conditions on set, including serious injuries to a Batwoman crew member who received third-degree burns over his whole body during production. Rose also blamed the work conditions for causing serious injuries to other crew members and slammed the show for ruining Kate Kane. Rose concluded by asking fans to stop asking if they would ever return to the show and said, quote, I wouldn't return for any amount of money nor if a gun were pointed to my head. Totally inappropriate with what happened today to even make a statement like that, but hey, nor did I quit. I did not quit. They ruined Kate Kane. They destroyed Batwoman, but not me. I followed orders, and if I wanted to stay, I was going to have to sign my rights away. Any threats and any bullying tactics or blackmail will not make me stand down. That was a lot. That was a lot. I feel like, I mean, they have messed up, or they have switched up their like statement about this exit so many different times that they don't even know how to keep it straight so it's just it's a very interesting thing because i feel like they are not relevant right now so they are looking for more reasons to get back into the press and then of course warner brothers television saw that and was like hold on hold on we are responding to them oh so the studio behind batwoman obviously of course had a strongly worded statement in response to the former star ruby rose uh, uh scratching fucking attack in a statement warner brothers tv collaborate rose's claim that they were fired from the show but refutes all other claims uh, the statement said quote despite the uh uh, revisionist history that <laughs> Definitely. Ruby Rose is now sharing online amid the producers of uh, the cast and crew and the network and the studio. The The truth is that Warner Brothers Television had decided not to exercise its option to engage Ruby for season two of Batwoman based on the multiple complaints about the workplace behavior that were extensive reviewed and handled are handled privately out of respect for all concerned such an investigation into rose's behavior on the batwoman set had long been rumored 
but not officially confirmed until now. In a separate statement issued by former Batwoman star Duggery Scott reaffirmed that the studio's assignment assessment that Rose was not brought back to season two based on multiple complaints about her workplace behavior, adding, I absolutely and completely refute the defam uh with all the damaging claims that are made by made against me by them. Uh, they are entirely made up and they never even happened. So, like we said, they can't even keep their story straight. So I mean, yeah, I, I loved it. Revisionist history is the perfectly worded response from Warner Brothers. She has changed her story so many times it's hard to even know what she said. They said, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I just I don't know. Yeah, you it, don't want to discount anybody's tales, but I mean, everybody seems to be pretty happy on that show. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Exactly. So. This one, I know you were wondering. They're making a Barbie movie. How can you have Barbie without Ken? Well, you can't. You gotta have Ken with Barbie, and now we know who it's gonna be. This is gonna excite a lot of people, I think. Ryan Gosling apparently is in final negotiations to star opposite Margot Robbie in the upcoming Warner Brothers and Mattel film Barbie. Oh, that's okay. Barbie is set to start production in early 2022 in London with a planned 2023 theatrical release. Not much else has been revealed about the movie's plot so far, but as we said, the one major question, who was going to play Ken? Well, now that's been answered. Ryan Gosling. Exactly. So Ryan Gosling as Ken, Margot Robbie as Barbie. Real life Barbie and Ken. Like that's it's really and like I mean, just saying. I think it's perfect casting. Anatomically correct though, I'm sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Uh <laughs> Warner Media lost a net one point eight million HBO and HBO Max company uh, customers after its deal with Amazon to carry HBO expired mm. in mid September. But an uptick in Latin America markets uh, more than made up for that difference. Worldwide, there were uh, 69.4 million global HBO Max and HBO subscribers at the end of quarter three, up to 1.9 million uh, and up uh, subscribed a little and up to uh, 12.5 million over the past 12 months. Now, the overseas growth for HBO and HBO Max. And subscriber gains for the price reduced HBO Max ad supported tier partially offset the estimated loss of 5 million HBO subscribers through the Amazon Prime channels. Now, I say that they should have just renewed this deal right. with Amazon and kept those subscribers, as well as had this popularity or this gain in popularity in latin america it would have only made sense but you know warner brothers just does interesting things so they do you they do know. including this next story so were you a fan of the many saints of newark well apparently david chase the man behind it he could be returning to the sopranos universe with a sequel to that very movie the many saints of newark uh, Ann Sarnoff, CEO of Studios and Networks at Warner Media, said that the company was thrilled with the results of the Many Saints of Newark. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and that they're talking to David about a new series, Sopranos related, for HBO Max. Now, Chase said that if he was to return to the Sopranos world, any such potential story would have to take place after the film, Many Saints of Newark, which is set in uh, the late 1960s and 70s, and before the original series, which starts off around 1998. So the 80s. Yeah. It would have to take place in the 80s, <laughs> like plain and simple. He also demanded that a certain writer that, that did the Many Saints of Newark also had to be involved and write with him. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, exactly. Would this actually be one about Tony Soprano? We'll see. We'll I see. mean, 80s, you would feel like it would have to be, right? Yeah, you like, would think. I mean, you would you think. think. Uh, season 3 of HBO Max's family dynasty drama Succession, which I really want to watch. Me I haven't too. watched yet, uh, which premiered this week, drew over 1.4 million viewers across all platforms that was a viewership high for the series and it was the best premiere night performance of any hbo original series since the launch of hbo max in may of 2020 the succession season three premiere increased viewership 21 percent versus the season two finale and was up 13 percent over the season two premiere as well as up 39 percent compared to the series debut 
debut back in 2018. So content keeps getting better and better. It's kind of like Titans. I mean, you see that a lot with a lot of HBO properties. So, oh, yeah. I mean, they, they, they kind of get their feet wet, but then they start gaining some traction end of season one season going into season two and the critics love this show as much as the fans they do yeah i definitely want to check this one out yeah okay switching over to viacom cbs what happens when two of the most powerful women in the world get together (laughs) it's going to be amazing that's what happens on november 14th five days before the release of adele's long-awaited fourth album, 30, which I'm hearing primarily focuses all on her divorce. Mm. That'll be interesting. Um, CBS will air a two-hour special called Adele, One Night Only, featuring a concert performance that will be the earliest opportunity for most of the world to hear the singer's first new material in more than six years. The two-hour event will be broadcast on the CBS television network, and available to stream live and on demand on Paramount+. Plus. To be filmed in Los Angeles, the special will include several of Adele's hits as well as several new songs. Now, why did I say two of the most powerful? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the only O that matters is joining the special. That's going to be freaking fantastic. It's going to feature an exclusive interview with Adele by Oprah Winfrey from her Rose Garden, of course, because that's where she does them all. Uh, In Adele's first televised wide-ranging conversation about her new album, the stories behind the songs, life after divorce, weight loss, and raising her son. Only O can get that. Yes. Only O can get that. Like, that's awesome. I'm super excited for that one. Hell yeah. CBS has given Ghost a full season order for the 2021-2022 broadcast season. That was quick. The freshman comedy, which just premiered back in October 7th, (laughs) which follows a young couple who inherit a country estate and decide to move into it and fix it up to become a bed and breakfast. While there, she has an uh, accident that allows her... Her to see many deceased residents uh, who are still uh, tethered to the home. The network did not confirm the episode total for the season yet, but like you said, that was very quick. So it's happy. I'm happy to see that CBS is gaining some traction with other content because Definitely. I mean they're putting themselves out there too with different shit. So absolutely, kudos. And every time I see a commercial for that show, I want to watch it. It does look really funny. So it does. N- yet another one we're gonna have to try to catch. CBS has taken in for development. I give it six months. <laughs> a multi-camera romantic comedy from Jordan Young, who, of course, is behind BoJack Horseman, written by Young in this anti-romantic romantic comedy. Two emotional wrecks in their 30s fall in love despite judgmental friends who assure them it's a mistake. They say there's someone for everyone, but should there be? <laughs> like, okay. Goodness. I, I love how they describe that, though. The anti-romantic romantic comedy. Right. Like, okay. Very interesting. Right. Maybe I give that show six months. There you <laughs> go. That's what it is. Uh, Uma Thurman has been cast alongside Arena Huffington in the Showtime series Super Pumped, which charts the rise of Uber. Uh, Huffington is the businesswoman and co-founder of Huffington Post, uh, who was the an Uber board member. So that's very interesting. I'm yeah. very interested to see how this series will actually do i know well the, uma i think will be it, it's a great choice to play ariana huffington i think uma sign kind of sort of looks like her so that, yeah. that, that, that'll be interesting to say the least but totally fucked up in the stacking right there because we could have done oprah uma uma oprah right anybody remember that david letterman okay moving on <laughs> <laughs> hey what will michael gandolfini do if they don't do another movie or series about the Sopranos universe, right? Well, don't worry. He's still getting work. Apparently, Michael Gandolfini and Zach Shore have joined the cast. This is another one I'm so excited to see of The Offer at Paramount Plus, which, of course, as we've told you, is the story of the making of The Godfather. The Offer is an office... The Offer is a 10-episode series based on the experience of Oscar-winning producer Albert S. Ruddy, played by the incomparable Miles Teller, detailing the -the behind-the-scenes events of the original 1972 film. 
Now, along with Teller, the series will star Matthew Good as producer Robert Evans, the golden boy of Hollywood, uh, you know, um, Giovanni Ribsy as Joe Colombo, Colin Hanks as Barry Lapidus, and Dan Fogler as Francis Ford Coppola. Juno Temple also joined the cast as Betty McCart, Ruddy's assistant. Now, Gandolfini will apparently play Andy Calhoun, an unexpectedly savvy businessman on the hunt to buy Paramount. Shore will play Fred Gallo, the assistant director running the set of The Godfather. That's interesting because um, Andy Calhoun was long associated with the mob. Yeah. So, of course, you're going to bring Gandolfini in to play him. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah, we need a mobster. Gandolfini, get him. Exactly. Like, okay. But, I mean, it's good to see him, like, getting more gigs. Agreed. Because he deserves it. Agreed. Uh, heading over to NBC Universal, Emily Blunt is the latest to be in talks to star in Christopher Nolan's upcoming World War II pick, Oppenheimer, uh, though nothing has been official yet, the casting would reunite Blunt and her Quiet Place 2 co-star Killian Murphy, yeah. uh, who will uh, portray a title role as J. Robert Oppenheimer um, in the film about the development of the atomic bomb. Blunt is expected to play the wife of Oppenheimer, um, <laughs> the American physicist who was pivotal in the Manhattan Project. Universal is backing the $100 million budget Oppenheimer after the Studio One writes in a heating bidding war against Paramount, Sony, and other major Hollywood players. It marks the first time in nearly two decades that Nolan isn't making a film with Warner Brothers. Mm. And by the way, he's making Oppenheimer. I'm up. So there it is. There yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it, that's what we were talking about. That Warner Media stuck now because they paid out all the men. You know, exactly. Pissed off some of them creators. Dun dun. I was so excited about this. I just watched it. I was thrilled. I loved it. I thought it was a brilliant way to bring back some awesome old characters and tell Olivia's story a little bit more. We even had a little snipe with uh, Stabler. Super pumped. Law and Order, if you guys missed it. Law and Order SVU celebrated its 500th episode. God, I don't even think you can fathom how impossible that is in television terms. Right. 500 episodes. It's groundbreaking. Like, no other series has hit 500 episodes, guys. That's freaking amazing. Um, And people tuned in to see it. Uh, put up the night's best numbers in top adults, 18 to 49. Rating among entertainment programming's uh, top, like I said, for the night. SVU drew a 0.64 rating among the adults, 18 to 49, for its milestone episode. Edging out CBS's Young Sheldon and ABC's Grey's Anatomy, both who came in with 0.63, for the lead in the key ad demographic. The 500th installment averaged 3.89 million viewers. Guys, I'm just going to say it. If you're still averaging 4 million viewers, Viewers after 23 years, people like the show. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, some shows can't average 4 million after three episodes. 23 years, you're still getting it. Yeah, kudos to you. Huge congrats, Mariska. Exactly, exactly. Well, George Lopez and his daughter, Mayan Lopez, are set to star in multi-camera comedy that has been picked up to pilot at NBC. I got this! Uh, the series titled Lopez vs. Lopez originally received a okay. put-to-pilot order at the broadcaster in June. The show is described as a working-class family comedy about a dysfunction, reconnection, and the pain and joy and all the in-between. So the George Lopez show, basically. I mean, I mean only with his grown-up daughter. Yeah, yeah. So okay. That's exciting. I mean, I, I. I mean, look, I like George Lopez. I do so too. I, I think it'll be funny. I do too. Um, hey, the Punishers, Amber Rose Reva and Belfast actor Victor Ali have joined Peacock's new Matthew Fox and Joanna Froggett series, Last Light. Fox and Froggett will play a married couple, Andy and Elena Yeats, in the new series. The five-episode dystopian miniseries centers around a family whose lives are changed forever when oil supplies get contaminated by an infectious agent causing society to implode in the face of a global disaster. Mm. Oh, very So you got to go back to the old days with no oil. Like, yeah, what the fuck? Exactly. Oh, how do we live? Oh, ah! goodness. Okay. Uh, heading over to Sony, they announced that they will now be opening Denzel Washington's directed drama A Journal for Jordan on Christmas Day instead of the initial launch on on December 10th in huh. NYC and LA with a wider break on December 22nd. In addition, they removed the L and Dakota Fanning World War II feature The Nightingale from 
its planned December 23rd of 2022 release. So what does that mean? Did they just take it off I know, altogether? There were, there, yeah, like, there was no like indication. They didn't announce a new date. So I don't mm. even know what that means. Yeah. I, I'm excited for this one with Michael B. Jordan, though. Yeah, like I Michael B. Too. Jordan and Denzel Washington directing it. Yeah. Hello. Exactly. I, I wonder why they decided to push it back a week till Christmas. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, either way, it was going to hit in December and be an Oscar race contender. So, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, Sharon! The Osbournes, man. Sharon, Ozzy. We love them. We love them. The lives, apparently, and epic love story of the rocker Ozzy and his manager and personality, Sharon Osbourne, and wife, of course, will be the subject of an upcoming Sony feature film, apparently. Oh. The untitled project comes from Polygram Entertainment and will follow a biopic format centering on their decades-long bond, one that exploded to the heights of pop culture with the flagship MTV reality series, The Osbournes, obviously. Oscar nominee Lee Hall, who did Billy Elliot, is scripting the project. Oh, very interesting. I mean, everybody's jumping on this bandwagon of biopics with yep. music people, but like, are they going to feature Black Sabbath? Are we going to get some original Ozzy music? Right. That's like all the I want to know. So weird, man, because they have had a very real, a rocky relationship, especially as of late. Yeah, yeah. like whew. so. Like this is I don't know. This is very interesting. I was surprised to see this come Me out. Too. So we shall see. Did you see this trailer before you start talking about I it? I haven't. Oh my I gosh. Haven't. It's like Spider-Man meets Mark Wahlberg. Oh shit. It's, oh dude, you're gonna fucking love the trailer. Oh man. Well, Columbia Pictures revealed their official trailer and the new images of Uncharted based on the PlayStation video game by Naughty Dog. Uh, the film will debut exclusively in movie theaters on February 18th of 2022. To my grandma's birthday, wow. and the film stars Tom Holland, Mark Wahlberg, Sophia Ali, uh, Tadia Gabriel, and uh, Antonio Antonia Banderas. Yes. Uh, the trailer introduces the audience to the young, street smart Nathan Drake, played by Tom Holland, and showcases his new or uh, his featured treasure hunting adventure with a wisecracking partner, Victor Sully Sullivan, played by Mark Wahlberg. They're gonna be great together. Oh. Dude, yeah. And an action adventure epic that spans the globe of the two in the dangerous pursuit of the greatest treasure never found. Uh while also tracking clues that may lead Nathan to his long lost brother. Yeah. So I'm yeah. excited. I I mean, I'm not a fan of the game. I've never played the game, so I don't really know the story or whatever, but the trailer, I'm all in. Just from one little scene in the trailer, there was a lot of action, a lot of stuff going on, Tom Holland doing what he does and everything, but there's this one scene when Wahlberg and Holland first meet, and Holland's behind the bar, and he's bartending, and Wahlberg walks up, and he's in like a tuxedo, and Wahlberg says to Holland, little young to be a bartender, aren't you? And Holland, like, just straight face turns back to him and says, Little old to be in going to prom. <laughs> like, as he said, it was fucking hilarious. And right there, you just knew these two are going to be great together. Just like, oh, it's going to be fantastic, That's bro. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. Let's jump to Lionsgate. I know you're probably excited about this one. The John Wick prequel series. At Stars, titled The Continental, has apparently cast Colin Woodle in the lead role. Mm. Woodle will star as a young Winston Scott, the character played in the film franchise by Ian McShane. Now, The Continental will explore the origin behind the Hotel for Assassins through the eyes and actions of Scott, who is dragged into the hellscape of a 1975 New York City to face a past he thought he'd left behind. Winston charts a deadly course through New York's mysterious underworld in a harrowing attempt to seize the iconic hotel which serves as the meeting point for the world's most dangerous criminals yes. the, prequel, the prequel is also rounding out its main cast with five new additions uh michelle prada will play kd hubert point delure jour uh will play miles jessica elaine has been cast as lou Nyung kate uh, has been cast as Yen, and Ben Robson has been cast as Frankie. Those five join lead, as we just told you, Colin Woodle, as well as Mel Gibson, oh, who's also been cast in it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, he hasn't really been on screen since, like, Fat Man, and I still haven't watched that one. So. Oh, my God. Dude, I loved I loved Fat Man. <laughs> Santa Claus is, like, a badass. Uh, like, oh, my gosh, dude. That's you, funny. Yeah, you definitely got to check it out. Uh, Castle Rock Entertainment, yes. the stalwart content label founded in 1987 by partners including Rob Reiner and Alan Horn, is reviving its film production unit with a $175 
million cash infusion. Reiner remains CEO of the outfit, while co-presidents Rachel Reiner and Matthew George will of uh, be the new fund will develop uh, and produce and finance feature films and is backed by the blue chip investors and banks. Castle Rock is behind some of the most incredible films in Amer- the American canon, including When Harry Met Sally, A Few Good Men, In the Line of Fire, City Slickers, Miss Congeniality, uh, The American President, and The Shawshank Redemption. The tele- on the television side, Castle Rock produced one of the most successful comedy series in the history that continues to dazzle the syndication field, Erner Seinfeld. Yeah. So. I mean, that list of uh, – and that's just a few of the massive things that Castle Rock was behind creating. Um, I'm super excited about this and good. Now we know where Alan Horn's going when he leaves Disney. Yeah, right. Remember, he's leaving soon. (laughs) Exactly. See you later. So now we know. Uh, Jumping to Netflix. Netflix is making a major shift, guys. Get this. And how the company reports viewership data for its content, shifting to a metric that is more closely aligned with traditional TV metrics. Now, as part of its third quarter earnings release this week, the streaming giant disclosed it will soon begin reporting viewership stats measured as the total number of hours viewed of a program during its first 28 days on the platform. Now, you guys know for years i mean originally they netflix only reported the number of households who watched at least a small portion of the program now they're going to tell the whole thing the whole total amount of hours viewed in the first 28 days they will also report viewership statistics more frequently than in the past so this is all kinds of new yeah, they're right. usually so self-guarded about that kind of stuff and don't put anything out there so i wonder if the other um, streamers are going to follow suit right exactly exactly well the final season of ozark will premiere january 21st of of 2022 mm. on Netflix with its first seven episodes. Now, the second seven episodes of the back half of the season will air following uh, later that year. Ozark follows the Bride family's criminal enterprise in the Ozarks. The patriarch Marty McBride, or Marty Bride, uh, Jason uh Bateman will be put in the series premiere back in 2017, and I mean, you guys know it. It's one of the most popular shows on streaming platforms right now, so it's very interesting, because I believe it's only like season four or five, so I mean, but they're on Netflix, so that doesn't surprise me, so it's kind of like a back and forth thing. (laughs) Speaking of popular on Netflix, one of its most popular movies, to all the boys I've loved before, is apparently getting a TV show, Netflix's first spinoff series from one of its original movies movies. Anna Cathcart, who portrayed teen matchmaker Kitty Song, Convey, in the streamer's young adult trilogy adaptation, will apparently reprise her role in the dramedy XO Kitty. Per the logline, Kitty thinks she knows everything about love, but when she moves halfway across the world to reunite with her long-distance boyfriend, she soon realizes that relationships are a lot more complicated when it's your own heart on the line. Mm. Yeah, that's. I feel like that's fact. You can tell other people how to do everything, but when it comes to yourself... You never listen. Exactly. You never listen. Exactly. And by far, the most exciting thing that we saw all freaking week, I mean, this show is going to be badass. Or is it a movie? It's a film. It's a film. All right. Amazon, Amazon Studios, has released a trailer for Aaron Sorkin's Being the Ricardos, starring uh, Nicole uh, Kidman and Javier Bardem. Uh, The film follows Hollywood couple Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, uh, played by Kidman and Bardem, uh, respectively, uh, during the production week on set of I Love Lucy throughout a Monday table read all the way through the audience shot on Friday. Both Ball and Arnez uh, face challenges that could end both of their careers and their marriage. In the trailer, a quick glimpse of the couple's whirlwind life are shown accompanied by Kidman's voiceover with the first clear look at Kidman's coming via the recreation of Ball's iconic yes. grape stomping scene. Yes. This looks so damn good. Oh man, it's amazing. And and by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, it did end their marriage. Yeah. <laughs> As the trailer says, the only reason she agreed to do I Love Lucy is so that she could work with Desi and do a project together and then inevitably it 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 while it brought them really close together, it did inevitably Tear them apart. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I think, and Aaron Sorkin is, if anybody is the guy to write that <laughs> story, it's Aaron Sorkin. For so. sure. And this guy's on West Wing now. Yeah, Aaron Sorkin. So good. All right. All right. Uh, let's see, jumping to Apple. 
Apple has apparently announced nine new additions to the cast of Extrapolations, an upcoming anthology series about climate change helmed by Scott Z. Burns. Oh, shit. These nine people are big, too. Meryl Streep, Sienna Miller, Kit Harington, Tahar Rahim, Matthew Reese, David Diggs, Gemma Chan, David Schwimmer, and Adarsha Gorav. Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, that's, they had to pay some money right there. They did. They're going to lead the series, which is currently in production and produced for Apple TV+. Plus. Michael Ellenberger's Medium Res. The series will examine how impending changes to the planet will affect love, faith, work, and family in people's lives over eight interconnected episodes. Ooh. I, I'm all in with that cast. How can you not be? you exactly. got to at least check it out. I mean, Exactly. I mean... Apple is putting out some very underrated content, in my opinion. So, just saying. They are. They are. What? I'm just reading ahead in the rundown. Reading ahead in the rundown, he says. Just reading ahead in the rundown. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, if you're watching the YouTube channel, now it's time for a brief intermission. All right. We are here, man. We're here. We're there. We're every freaking where. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, man. This week... I mean, if it couldn't get more <laughs> crazy as possible, this week's top five is most hated movies that we just <laughs> did not like. Yeah, facts. Yeah, just saying. Facts. Just saying. Uh, number five for me is actually kind of surprising because it has a lot of people that we know and love, including Captain America himself, Chris Evans, and uh, Shyler Lee, who was on Grey's Anatomy mm-hmm. and Supergirl. Mm-hmm. Not another teen movie. A lot of my most hated movies are comedies. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> I mean, you know, some people like certain kind of comedies, and I thought this one was just stupid. But this one is supposed to be making fun of teen movies, which makes sense, but in general, I thought it was stupid. Especially, I love Varsity Blues, so I fucking hated when they put the scene in there with the whipped cream and the fucking, the banana. I just, I hated that shit. So, so stupid. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know. I agree. Yeah. Uh, my number five most hated movie ever, and I think it's on everybody's list, is the um, Forgettable, and I wish it would just go away and burn all copies in existence ever, John Travolta's Battlefield Earth. Uh, uh. I mean, guys, you know, Scientology already has bad rap, right? And this movie did nothing, nothing, nothing. to try to change that. Um, <laughs> in fact, it made it even worse. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, this movie, I, I, I don't even have any – I can't say anything about it. It just literally sucks from start to finish. It is like god-awful, definitely one of the worst cinematic experiences ever put on film. That's yeah. That's all I'm going to say. That's it. Right I mean, there. fact, don't watch it. Yeah. Don't watch it. Yeah. Okay. You know. Uh, and I mean, speaking of a Mel Brooks film, I mean, we've been talking about Mel Brooks like – all the time recently, I feel like. Uh, this one, I think I'm just so... I, I beloved Star Wars so much, and I am not a big fan of spoof movies at all. So this is by no surprise, Spaceballs. Not a fan of Spaceballs at all. It was just poorly done. You know poorly why done. the Schwartz isn't with you? Because you weren't fucked up when you watched this movie. Mm. That's the way you have to watch it, okay? Like, you have to be totally just buzzing or blasted out of your mind. Uh, then the movie's a whole different ballgame. It's totally different experience. <laughs> That's a, I was totally blasted out of my mind when I watched it at the theater um, and loved every second of it. Absolutely every second of it. I'm horrified that this movie is on your list. Um I I don't know what to say. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a pass on the, on the number one because I feel like a lot of people are with you on that. But this one I can't give you a pass. I'm horrified. I don't know. <laughs> We're gonna have to get totally fucked uh, up and have you watch it again. Apparently. <laughs> um, and then you'll have a whole new light for it. Right. Okay. This number, my number four. I couldn't even get through, and I tried. I tried, and I tried, and I just couldn't finish the movie. No matter how many times I tried, I couldn't finish it. I'm talking about Netflix's darling, it's Oscar contender, one of the greatest films ever made, blah, 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 Roma. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Sucked. Yeah. It, was- it sucked. It sucked. It sucked. Yeah. There were gratuitous shots that made no sense. There were scenes that didn't need to be in it. The story didn't flow well. 
it didn't flow so well that I fell asleep numerous times trying to watch this film. And I still have not finished it. I'm not going to. I'm not going it's to. It's one of my most hated movies. I'm just not going to. I'm sorry, Alfonso Cuaron. It sucked. Just my opinion. But there it is. Number four, Roma. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Number three for me is one that you and I both heavily disliked and i mean is actually a mass audience success yeah so um kissing booth kissing booth is kind of just a ripoff of every good teen movie in my opinion i mean it's kind of weird too because old boy who plays like the love interest is odd he's very odd i hate the way he attacks (laughs) that character he's very weird and standoffish and kind of like I don't know, just socially awkward. So it's just not entertaining to watch. So that's why number three for me is Kissing Booth. It's the perfect example of a Netflix original movie as opposed to a movie that Netflix picks up. Literally. And bills as an original movie. Yeah, Yeah, that's... Not a Netflix film. It's a Netflix original. Yes, (laughs) there you go. Um, My number three is the reason we lost all superhero movies until the 1989 Batman and that big gap is because of this movie right here, and it's Superman for the Quest for Peace. Mm. No. Christopher Reeve only did this movie because he was against uh, nuclear weapons and he wanted to like promote nuclear proliferation and, and the destruction of what could happen with nuclear weapons and everything. And so the, hence the storyline with the nuclear man as the bad guy. Um, it's the only reason he signed on to do it, and he shouldn't have. Man, he shouldn't he should have. should have just like – this movie took everything that I held impassioned in my heart <laughs> from Superman the movie um, and Superman 2 that made me want to be a filmmaker, that made me believe that a man could fly, put it in a box, covered it in gasoline, lit it on fire, and torched the ever-living shit out of it. Mm. It was one of the single worst movies I have ever seen in my life. You could see the cables when they were flying – Nuclear man kidnapped and brought up a woman into space. They were talking. You can't even fucking breathe in space. How are you having a conversation? She's not nuclear. She's just a fucking human. How is she in space? Like, nothing about this movie was good. Nothing. The acting, the writing, the directing, the special effects, everything, nothing was good. Just... Don't ever watch it. Just do as I did. Superman 3 and 4 just don't even exist. They never happen. Just move on. (laughs) Just move on. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, Well, moving on to number two, I believe is one of the beginnings of Adam Sandler, like, beat down, beating a dead horse Mm. to death even more, is Jack and Jill, when basically he played twins. When, I mean, we were talking about that earlier. Mm-hmm. It was so bad. I was so surprised that Al Pacino signed on to this thing. I like, agreed. It was so fucking bad. This was one that I literally could not finish. So that's why it's on my no, my list is number two. It's just – it's the start of overplaying the same character. Yeah. And, I mean, he'd had some hits too around the same time. Grown Ups and Grown Ups 2, very popular when he got the boys all back together. But this one, so bad. Yeah, Pacino – Definitely dialed it in and took the payday on that one. There's no, yeah, just, no, no. Okay. My number two, much like what you said uh, for your film that it, it's, you know, with the kissing booth that it's, we hate it, but it's really popular. Um, my number two, much like that, Twilight. I and, feel like everybody should know this. <laughs> all of the fucking Twilight movies that are after it. All, just the Twilight saga. Uh, what? I love Pattison. They're finally he's finally going to get to play something to do with a bat that's going to make him badass. But I got to tell you guys, front and center, vampires don't fucking sparkle. Yeah. Okay, they don't fucking sparkle. This is only the second movie in my entire life that I literally got up and walked out on. Tootsie was number 1, Twilight number 2. Mm. I literally Literally got up and said, what the fuck is this? It sounded badass. I had never heard of the book, so I wasn't familiar. I right. just saw the thing. And I'm like, ooh, vampires versus werewolves. This is going to be badass. Okay, all right. We go in. No. Mm-mm. Hmm. Nope. Mm-mm. And, and wrong answer. Whoo, out of there. I- I'm just not a fan. I'm a huge fan of Pattison. I, th- I think he's fantastic. I think he might – you guys heard me last week. I think he might jump to the top of my list as my favorite Batman. Maybe. 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 I don't know. But – 
Not Twilight. No. Most hated movie for sure. I. Sorry, guys. Sorry mm. for everybody that loves that franchise, but nope. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. Before I go to my number one, I got some honorable mentions because I just thought about them. Sure, sure. Um, sorry to bother you. Remember that Lakeith Stanfield movie where oh like, my God, they were trying where they to were transform tra- Changing them into horses? <laughs> yeah. Really fucking weird. That really everybody thought was like brilliant, but no. Okay. Okay. Uh, and no. on that, I have an honorable mention. The Lighthouse. The Speaking Lighthouse. of Patterson. Oh, my God. So bad. What the fuck was that? I thought about <laughs> walking out of that one too. Oh my yeah. God. No. We just stayed to see if it would get back and no, it didn't. It did never did. Ooh, never did. Okay. And also fucking Orson Welles' last film that was never finished and then put onto Netflix. That one was <laughs> awful too. <laughs> I am just saying. Like the documentary was way better. Talking about his progression and, of course, coming back to America and doing American cinema. But this, the actual film, fucking weird, okay? I don't know if he was trying to make a sex tape and, like, put some storyline into it. Just fucking weird, okay? (laughs) I'm just saying. But anyway, my number one goes to Napoleon Dynamite. This is the one that, when I was growing up, I was excited for this one. I was pumped. I really was super happy for it to finally come out. We get everybody together, watch it as a family with my older brothers, and... I was like, what the fuck? And basically every weekend when all of the brothers would come together, we would each pick out movies. And granted, there's like five of us. So we would each pick out movies and watch every single one back to back. And one of these motherfuckers would always pick Napoleon Dynamite. And I'm like, I don't care. Put it at the end, but I'm not staying awake for that shit. I do not fucking care. They thought it was hilarious. I fucking hated it. So that's why number one is Napoleon Dynamite. And probably it's their fault because they tried to make me watch it so many times, even though I didn't like it in the beginning. But so adding fuel to the fire of hatred is because they tried to make me rewatch that shit. So So you did not vote for Pedro. I did not. Did not vote for Pedro. No, I give zero shit. (laughs) Zero sitch about Pedro. Zero fucking shit. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. I'll give you a pass on that one. Yeah. I just uh, that's one of those I really do feel like you either love it or hate it, and it, I think it's fifty fifty. Yeah. I think that is how it is. Okay. So for what Superman four: The Quest for Peace did, which would destroyed the Superman franchise and made us have to wait a really long time before we got superhero movies back with the eighty nine Batman. Well, my number one <laughs> took the eighty nine Batman and Batman Returns in ninety two. And destroyed the franchise. Uh, and then made us have to wait decades again until we got the Blade movies and X-Men and starting the resurgence of the superhero movies. And thank you, Joel Schumacher, for fucking everything up again for superhero movies. I'm talking about Batman and Robin and slash Batman Forever. Because they basically were all just one huge shit show, yeah. okay? Tim Burton did a brilliant job bringing back Batman. Dark, Keaton, the man, the Batmobile. Everything's gothic. Everything's all. Aw- Joel Schumacher fucking put neon lights on the Batmobile, put nipples on the fucking bat suit. What the fuck are we doing, Schumacher? What the fuck? It was... I don't even have any explanation for it. Like, like it, it took... It made fucking Batman... The, the 66 Batman TV show looked like a serious fucking toned documentary. Okay? <laughs> and that was campy as shit. But they didn't have nipples. No. They didn't have fucking neon Batmobiles. Like, what the fuck was Schumacher thinking? I don't know. What? I just... <laughs> I, I feel bad for Val Kilmer. Like, and George Clooney. And George Clooney. I, I, just from dusk till dawn. I saw from dusk till dawn, and I saw George Clooney in that film, and I said, and when I heard that he was going to be cast as Batman, I'm like, hell yes, he's going to be a perfect Bruce Wayne, a perfect Batman, and then Joel Schumacher's coming on board. I thought, oh my God, the Lost Boys, this is going to be epic. Hmm. I don't know whether he fucking got bad drugs before he started, or like, what the fuck? <laughs> It was nothing like I thought was going to happen. It was god-awful. Yeah. And the -the over-the-top fucking Jim Carrey Riddler and the stupid-ass Arnold Schwarzenegger Mr. Freeze. I just like everything about it. Yeah. Tommy Lee Jones, Two-Face. Oh, my God. Harvey Dent was so much better played by Billy D. Williams. 
Williams. Yeah. The smooth Billy D. Williams. Exactly. And we didn't get we got Chris O'Donnell, nothing against Chris O'Donnell, but Chris O'Donnell is fucking Robin. I would have much rather seen Marlon Wayans as the black Dick Grayson yeah. and the like coming from the streets, like that storyline that they Burton was gonna go with. We missed out on so much. Yeah, he kind of was a little out. bitch, right? He, I mean, it just and Batgirl. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, it was bad. No, it, it was, was bad. There, there you go. There, the obvious there choices for my most hated fucking films ever. There it is. Like, we guys, or well, you guys <laughs> have some most hated films. I'm we sure you know. do. <laughs> please, please let us know because it's definitely a conversation starter. <laughs> uh, heading over to the box office recap. Halloween Kills dominated last week with 49.4 million, uh, which is a good film. A lot of people are hating on it, but it's really good. So go check it out. Um, and just quickly before. There you go. That shows what damage HBO Max did to Dune. Yeah. Because it's going to make less than Halloween kills. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there you go. And which was also on Peacock. Yeah. Like same day release. So I don't know, man. I don't know either. Uh, No Time to Die brought in 23.8 million. Beautiful film, still in my opinion. Um, Number three, Venom Let There Be Carnage, 16 and a half million. Number four is The Addams Family, two with 7.1 million. And The Last Duel brought in about the same amount that it did its first weekend uh, with 4.5 or 4.8 million. I don't honestly know how that one's still hanging around. I I feel like the only reason that's still in the top five is because everything else is sold out and that's the one you have to go see because it's the only thing left. Yeah. Like I I just – otherwise I don't know why it's still there. I still want to see it just to see it and see what people are talking about because a lot of people are saying it's good but i mean like i said it's weird to see these guys in that role (laughs) uh movies coming out dune everybody go check out dune it's really freaking good whether you stream it or go to theater after streaming it on hbo max i wish i would have had to gone go go to the theater but there was a lot of different aspects that caused me to stream it on hbo max uh really it's all fucking warner brothers fault it's all their fault um (laughs) but the french dispatch ron's gone wrong warning and cloudy mountain i want to check out ron's gone wrong that's the uh the disney animated film that new disney animated interesting yeah it sounds pretty good uh movies you can still go see shang chi and the legend of ten rings free guy lamb the most eligible eligible bachelor and so many more guys so many more select theaters now heading over to the imdb pro top trending segment all of these are by no surprise. The top trending movie is No Time to Die. The top trending show is Squid Game. I, I haven't jumped on that one. I, I still can't. It should be dope sick. I, yeah. I, it should be dope sick. I agree. They were number one and number two of the most watched new series yeah. this last week. Uh, Danny uh, posted that. It should be flip-flopped, guys. Yeah, agreed. And Ana de Armas as the top trending star. <sighs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she should always be the top trending star. Yes. I, I I don't know whether I'm excited or not excited to see her as Marilyn Monroe. Right. I just I, I don't know. We'll see. She's a great actor. Man. She is. A great but actor. I I have just hold a really sweet spot for Marilyn Monroe. I just always been a huge Marilyn fan and just like of the history of her and everything. So and nobody's gotten her right so far. No. Nobody. But if anybody can. It's we'll on. see. We'll see, man. We'll see. <laughs> but anyway, guys, thank you so much for getting crazy on episode 178 of Inside the Crazy Ant Farm. We got to make sure you follow the company and the podcast on social media. So at Crazy Ant Media and at ItCap Podcast on all podcast or on social media platforms. Follow us both personally on social media platforms. Myself at JLo Fantastic and at Crazy Ant Guy 1970. That's right. And you can subscribe to the podcast anywhere you listen to your podcast. Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio Podcast. Bean Stitcher and so much more. If you're watching the video on YouTube, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell for all the latest and greatest notifications. Next week is the big Halloween episode, so we will have costumes. So be prepared. Even more reason to watch the YouTube videos and subscribe to the channel. JLo's going as Napoleon Dynamite. (laughs) Yeah, fuck that. Uh, be Don't sure. lie, he's got the vote Pedro right in the closet. I saw it. Negative, senor. <laughs> uh, be sure to visit our website, www.crazyantmedia.com, where you can start rocking the latest and greatest Crazy Ant Media gear. We've got shirts, we got hats, we got sweatshirts, we got so much stuff, guys. So yes. it's fucking amazing. Now, this episode was very important because we got to talk about a very serious issue that is going on. And I mean, just being safe on set with it being stunts, with it being uh, firearms 
uh, fire in general. Like you just have to be safe on set. It's a very glamorous industry, but it's also very dangerous that not a lot of people talk about. So, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're an actor, if you're anyone who is ever on set, be sure to do the proper protocols and just stay safe, man. Really stay I'm, safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Hey, listen, uh, Check out, uh, if you guys can, uh, I mean, I did, and I, I think it's really important, and I think it was a, a smart move by AFI and, and a touching tribute from the husband. Um, AFI, of which, if you guys aren't familiar with, Helena Hutchins uh, was a graduate of, they have started a scholarship in her name that will target and focus on women cinematographers. Um, and in lieu of cards or, or, you know, flowers and all that, the husband has asked if you could just in memoriam, make a donation to that scholarship fund. Uh, the links are in my uh, bio on Instagram and I share it on Twitter. Um, if you guys could make a donation to that, that would be amazing and a great way to help carry on this young woman's amazing legacy. Um, and if you can't donate money, if you're not able to do that, just share. Share the link and share the post. You can help that way too. Because um, I think it's it's important to continue her legacy and, and to inspire. Because I, I feel like she was inspiring to so many young women trying to follow in her path and to have this tragic loss we need to keep that going um so if you guys can do that agreed man agreed there's a lot of stuff and i mean marvel stuff crazy uh and the top hated films i mean <laughs> you know and adele 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 with who with the one the only oprah, oprah!